Science. Nowhere is the ascent of the Logos most prevalent within society than the domain of reductionist science and technology, a curve which has grown ever steeper with every advance in left-brain modes of thought. It is hard to say exactly when modern science began. Many scholars would date it at roughly 1600, when Kepler and Galileo started using precision measurement to map the universe. Shortly after came the Age of Enlightenment, which is generally historically noted as a time of the scientific revolution. Crisp literature, due to the introduction of the printing press, along with growing alphabet literacy and intellectual prowess leading to new systems of thought. Since then, science has positioned itself as the de facto epistemology of which all others must submit themselves to. Yet science is simply a philosophical method of inquiry, and as such the questions that science asks depends on its ontology. Everything, therefore, hinges upon at least one, usually unstated, metaphysical assumption. Scientific realism claims, for example, that the world described by science is equivalent to the quote-unquote real world, that theories can be falsified, that the entities described by the scientific theory exist objectively and independent of the mind, and that science is ever perfecting its theories. It sounds good on paper, but the first assumption itself suggests that description and quantification alone is the quote-unquote truth, yet it is forever held at a distance as an object and not subsumed as a subject. It therefore also traps itself within tautology using determinist and binary logic. Ironically, the one reality science cannot reduce is the only reality we will ever know. Therefore, every theory is necessarily false because it is always incomplete. The second assumption implies that mind is located within body, however the hard problem of consciousness remains as elusive as ever and cannot be simply reduced to neural correlates. No scientific model of the mind will be wholly complete unless it includes what can't be reduced, yet as mentioned previously, what can't be reduced is outside of theory. The final assumption indeed highlights that theories are just maps and models of what they attempt to describe and can never match the resolution of the infinitude of dimensionality within the indescribable. Scientific realism assumes that time plus data equals understanding, however as suggested by cognitive atavism, our awareness and cognition of the world becomes more complex as the level of awareness of the world increases. We are forever finding new ways to see the world, therefore paradigms should not be negated, but rather appended to our existing level of knowledge and awareness. As Jean-Francois Lyotard reasoned, Modern science has an inbuilt hostility towards other narratives and, and therefore it illegitimizes itself by remaining incredulous towards its own meta-narrative. Vladimir Nabokov said, The greater one's science, the deeper the sense of mystery. Karl Popper noted, It is imperative that we give up the idea of ultimate sources of knowledge and admit that all knowledge is human, that it is mixed with our errors, our prejudices, our dreams and our hopes. And lastly, Douglas Adams said, There is a theory which states that if ever anybody discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. During the Age of Enlightenment, René Descartes was a very influential figure at the time who conceptualized the universe as a mechanism made of parts. He also reignited the old philosophical debate of dualism, which we have all been contending with in one way or another since the very emergence of the self. His famous quote being, I think, therefore I am. He found that the only thing that he could not doubt was whether he had a mind, yet he could not explain how a mind could cause anything in a material body. He separated these two quote-unquote eyes into subject and object, body and mind, and therefore became lost in his own theory of mind. He presupposed that there is an I that could know that it is thinking, but the I never sees itself, except as a self-referential object. Only when there is no I can reality truly be seen. The reductionism unleashed by Descartes led to the development of idealistic philosophy to maintain that people have free will. This further estranged us into dualism between the material world and the world of mental free will a dualism that can still be found today within the incompatibility of quantum mechanics and general relativity. In more recent times, the development of systems thinking has provided methods for tackling issues in a holistic rather than reductionist way. Institutionalized science is, of course, deeply tied to religion, both historically and politically. This is a hard thing for many people to accept, but science emerged as a differentiation of cultural values. Science and religion are both guided by political motives, i.e. power, the scientific progress we have witnessed in the 20th century did not happen by chance. It came out of a social contract between governments and research institutes. In fact, an alarming amount of scientific research is used for destructive purposes by the quote-unquote defense industry. 
individual scientists within research programs may find their research findings are not welcomed by the higher political directives of the organization. Science has now disassociated so much from the other cultural spheres of art and morals that it cannot proceed any further into reductionism. It must instead reintegrate the aesthetic and find a narrative to place its findings within a societal context. It is clear that the divide between scientists and the avant-garde is not just a deep occupational crevasse, but a practical one which ultimately is holding back scientific progress. By bridging into the arts and creating a reciprocal relationship, science can gain new insights into the problems it faces. Neuroscience, for example, excels at unravelling the mind from the bottom up, but our self-consciousness seems to require a top-down approach. Richard Powers wrote, if we knew the world only through synapses, how could we know the synapse? The rapid progress of neuroscience has in fact exposed the limitations of its paradigm, just as reductionism has failed to solve the problem of consciousness. The arts can provide science with a lens to glimpse into its blind spots by encompassing the subjective. Daniel Gilbert wrote, When you first look at a drawing such as Escher's relativity, everything seems fine. But when you inspect it, you suddenly realize that what you're seeing is impossible. Each section of the canvas is coherent, but all these possible parts add up into an impossible whole. Escher's work exposes the masterful fraud that our brains perpetuate upon us, the neural magic show that we call reality. All that being said, that is not to deny the usefulness of strict methodology, experimental data and testability of scientific theories in developing our understanding. We do, however, need to acknowledge the limitations and allow for subjectivity into the scientific method. That is, of course, met with much bemusement and hostility by scientists who pride themselves on their rationality. They object that art is far too incoherent and imprecise for science to make use of. However, such incoherence exists within our everyday reality that scientific understanding cannot adequately explain. Why not accept that and utilize it rather than deny it? Paradoxes only exist as paradoxes when they are judged as such.